Shout out to all my beautiful nature lovers out there. It's your boy Ian, AKA the Lit Professor, here today to drop the first lesson in the Spiritual Ecology course, which is pages one through 11 of David Abrams' Becoming Animal. So first of all, if you guys would like to sign up for the Spiritual Ecology course, you guys can for free at thelitunderground.com. The link is above the photo right now and is also in the description, no matter where you were listening or watching this right now. And this is a free course that surpasses anything that you would get in a university. And I am going to be critiquing, editing, and supporting your journal entries book reports and final essays for free for till the end of time because I know how important spiritual ecology is. If you guys would like more inter information, I have already uploaded and filmed an introduction video that goes over all this and what you need to know for the course, or you can find all that out at the link above. So let's hop right into this, everybody. What is, and oh, just a quick FYI. There is a movie, Becoming Animal, that I watched last night with you know, a loose storyline, a loose presence by David Abram. And it's pretty good. If you guys really love this book or want to go even deeper, uh, go check it out. It's not an action thriller, but it's it's a good book. And it's filmed in Grand Teton National Park, where I spent a lot of time over this past summer at my while visiting my family. So what what is Becoming Animal? What What is the main concept of this book? Like, why why did I choose this first? I have five... We're covering five seminal texts in spiritual ecology, and there's 500 others. Why is this one going first? Because this book is about living a, a phenomenological experience with nature. And why am I using that highfalutin word, phenomenological? Because that is going to be a huge theme in this course. But what does that mean? That is just a basic or a more advanced term for awareness, direct awareness, awareness in reality of what's happening. You looking out and having nothing else on your mind while you are experiencing reality, contact with nature. And that's what this book is going on. Not just having an experience with nature because any, anybody can walk out for two hours in nature and have direct contact with nature if they leave their phone and just kind of relax a little bit. But accepting what's going on within nature, accepting what, who we are as two-legged animals, accepting our presence, and then even more so than that, and this is what this course is gonna be about, is living that phenomenological experience with nature, no matter if you're in a room like I am right now, or at a work, or on your lunch break, no matter when, where, or how, you can experience nature, because nature is always around us. So, this, this course and this book, and this, idea of living in contact with nature is not a drill. This has been being built upon for thousands of years and in the academic and artistic world for a while since really, in my opinion, the Chinese poets took it to a whole new level. Tu Fu and um, Cold Mountain. This is about speaking, living, living and listening to the natural world. Full integration. And I would like to address before we even go any further, the critics out there, because there's going to be, I already know it, and that there's going to be people, you don't need a course for this. Why would you need a course for uh, learning how to exist with nature? Okay. Okay. So let's let David Abram, who d puts, David Abram just slams the haters in the introduction of this book. That's what this, that's why this video is going to be longer than maybe some of the other ones for the length, in uh, correlation with the length of only 12 pages. Because he is literally slamming all the people. Because if you are a person who loves words and loves arts and integrates that with nature, you have met the Luddites. You have met those people. And let's listen to what David Abram has to say. Look at, oh, and boom. Yet words are human artifacts, are they not? Surely to speak or to think in words is necessarily to step back from the world's presence into a purely human sphere of reflection. Such precisely has been our civilized assumption. But what if meaningful speech is not an exclusively human possession? What if the very language we speak now arose first in response to, animate, to an animate, expressive world, as a stuttering reply not to the others of our species, but to an eg enigmatic cosmos that already spoke to us in a myriad of tongues? Boom, everybody. Did you hear that? I got to go full screen for that. Did you hear that? Boom, where are all the haters at now? But we will continue addressing the haters as we go on and all the doubters. So, and that, 
the people who really are, get into this are the homesteaders, the Luddites, the people who have learned to detach from the world, the people who have, for whatever reason, do not want to be a part of the world anymore because home people who are not of the world are perfectly fine. That is a great and noble path and you are actually creating good in the world, but disappearing from the path is maybe a problem because why become a detached, bitter, and sad Luddite who has to comment on people who are, you know, like David Abram, why, does, why did he put that in there? Because he has experienced a certain amount of hate in his life since he wrote probably Spell the Sensuous and became a public figure. Because no matter what, people, the people who are detached from reality, from the phenomenological experience of what's going on because they're living out on a farm and they're in a huge echo chamber, guess what? I know that you're connected with nature. I know that you can experience it and we don't need this. But what about everybody else? That's what this course is about. Helping everybody else, the seven, the seven other billion people who haven't done that yet. Good for you. You did it. Turn it off. We don't need you. But if you want to step up and help other people, you're going to have to get out of that. You're going to have to put yourself out there and continue moving forward. And the people who slam, okay, and what that quote was really saying is that language and I, I heard this like a couple weeks ago. I was talking to somebody who like spends a lot of time in nature. And they're like, nature removes me from the concept. The Tao that is not called the Tao is not the Tao. And I'm like, yes. But <laughs> what David Abram just said, what if there is a, what if language came from forms within nature? The fo and I'm going to get a little bit deeper into this in a bit. What if the, they, they came from forms within nature? What if language wasn't to say, Bleh get away from me or wow, food. What if language didn't come up in that way, but came out from nature? Because we are not the only species with language and we have no idea about plant languages between plants and within all the different um, kingdoms. We don't know those relationships yet. We just are stuck in our little world. And that's why, and that's why, the people who act like this are really no different than people who are super religious and people and people who are super scientific. And it seems like there's a weird cross parallel that I've seen before to people who are out there and act like this to being very dogmatic or very in either a religious sense, either super left brain or super right brain. And that's just what I've seen. And I, I'm not ranting here. David Abrams is the one who's putting this in his book. The religious people, the scientists, everybody. And the, it's about the, creating a referential to nature, creating a separation from nature, creating a hierarchy within nature. Like, look at these goofballs, bro. Like, and it's important, but what is going on, everybody? And we don't need dropouts in this war. In a war where, and it is the war that the earth and the environment is being destroyed. We don't need people who are being wispy. We don't need people who are not seeing reality. We need people who are studying the forms of nature. And I'm going to read a passage from Robert Bly right now in his essay. I think it's titled form that is neither in, neither in nor out. And he says, quote, so when we speak of form as a wildness and consider a poem's form as drawn from the careful economy of nature, we can then imagine the poem as being as a being that moves fast, can leap in the air, escape from tigers or professors, and live for generations, even during lean times. And what Bly is trying to say is that the best natural poetry is one that forms from nature, that finds from nature. And it's if we study nature, if we study this photo right now, these looks like, I guess, flamingos, if I'm saying that correctly. Um, that is a wild form. That is something that leaps and bounds and dies and has to survive if it wants to continue on. Those flamingos right there. And art and the best art and the best things have that form. It mimics animals. It mimics nature. It, art, even though art and the avant-garde has kind of ruined that concept, it's still there. It's still existing from nature. Every, the axiomatic root of everything is from nature. And look... When you discover and can live in this reality where, for instance, and these energetic codes exist and we don't have that as much in poetry because of Christianity and the break of um, nature in Christianity. 
Um, but you see it, though, in Beowulf. If you guys have ever read the uh, Middle English or Old English of Beowulf, there it is... It looks natural. It has a certain form to it. And even Chaucer, a couple hundred years later, had a bit of that form. And then suddenly it disappeared. Boom, out of it. And if you look at the occult, if you look at things like the Kabbalah and other things, everything has a form. There are forms to this earth. There are forms that we are going, that if we study, we will connect deeper with nature. And, and in the third book of the series, The Mystery, Mystery Teachings of the Living Earth, I am th that is what that book is about. It's basically a remix of the Kybalion. So stay tuned for that. We'll get into this concept way further lately, later. And da uh, David Abram on page five starts responding. Let's pull this up. Responding to all the haters. He responds to religion. Um, the people who want to take direct engagement with nature away and replace it with these things I'm going to be going over right now. And what they're trying to replace it with is, of course, and when I mean replace it, when I'm saying replace it, they want to create it as a referential, as not the direct phenomenological experience that we are trying to get to. They are trying to separate it, create it, and make it a simulacra, a copy of a copy. And now nature has been reduced with virtual reality to a copy of a copy of, of a copy times 100, with, and we can't even track its original origin. And that's what's crazy with, about the internet. I just said that everything has an origin in nature. And of course, the technology powering it does. But a lot of the ideas have even transcended nature, which is, which is kind of scary. So of course, we have religion, everybody. The big kahuna. Um, for thousands of years, we have tried to, instead of experiencing nature, we have tried to wisp it off into ways to, um, into mythologies and superstitions and mo mostly to avoid death but that you know that's a different story then and, and you know i don't this happens but you know most if you're listening to this you probably don't deal with two religions of people unless you have family members or work somewhere weird but the people who i deal with the most are the neurotransmitters the atheists oh excuse me the <laughs> that's all they are is just neurotransmitters because it's all consciousness is is just neurotransmitters firing uh these neurotransmitters are firing and synapsing, and that's what creates consciousness. Or, and I'm sure you've heard that before when you ask, what is consciousness? They don't, and you know, there are different theories. If you read the theories of Schelling and get into Carl Jung and stuff, that there, nature might be the way our conscious or unconscious manifests. And that's what, you know, I think, we'll, we'll, like I said, we'll be getting into that more. The other way is DNA. There are behavior. We're just animals that are programmed by DNA and all this and what I'm doing and your cat and the mountain lion out there is all just DNA acting out. Or even worse, worst of all, and this is like the new thing, is the subatomic realms. It's physics. It's, we can't even see it. It's gone beyond. It's the Big Bang. It's particles within particles that are influencing all these different things. And you need to know who the people are saying this. If the only people who say this are saying it to be cool and to be a jerk. It's to just be redundant. You know, anyone can play the logical game. If we want to sit in logic land, I can do that all day. I can go to the nth degree and I can do that. But there is no exploration. There is no trust in something deeper. And I'm not talking about God. I'm talking about even trusting other humans or trusting nature or reality or love or emotions. There is no trust with clowns like this. Look, at you've all heard it. You've... Ugh. Well, I can't see it. Well, I love nature, but that's too... Logic is the... Empiricism is the only thing that can save society. You know, I have heard it a million different times, and it's old, and that's... We're try, I'm trying to destroy these people right now. And if you want to read, I think on page five and six, David Abram, um, as I'm sure you saw, destroys this. And what, what do you do? I'm here to talk about what do we do about these people. You know what we do with these people? We throw them out. We create social pressure on these people. Don't engage. What repeat? Do not engage with these people. You can engage in places, one-way activities like this, but we need to create a reality where they can't participate, where they, um, people are going to look at them like, why are you so cold? Because in this all combines this kind of logical approach works great with capitalism because capitalism is a cutthroat. Capital is a artificial concept that cuts through everything that if you chase capital then you can make an excuse for any behavior it can get rid of everything and there's this distinct connection 
with capital. And um, this isn't school anymore, everybody. We're not stuck in school anymore. I get it. In school, there you have to play games with people, and there's the logic, and the, there's a girl that's way too emotional. We're not stuck there anymore. And we have to. And what I meant by creating social pressures is that those people are going to be ostracized. Those people are now the norms. With you know, so much science now out there that this is now the norm. And there is an integration of ecology and biology in the sciences, but. That, once again, that is not the solution. I don't care what you figure out about nature. If everybody isn't on board, if we don't have at least even 10% of people living a full phenomenological experience with nature, and I would assume that it's probably right now 0.00001 um, of the world's population, then it doesn't matter what study or uh, protest you go to. None of that matters. What law you pass, because in the long run, we're going to destroy it anyway. It all gets destroyed. And yes, we are, I am smart enough to admit that science and logic has done insurmountable things for us, that we would still be stuck chopping off limbs and without penicillin, with all these different things, and that there is a time and place for that. But the time and place for that is the eight-hour workday where the scientists and the logic, logic, logicticians do their work. But then outside of work, they keep living it. People, people who aren't even scientists are living their whole existence as scientists. It's so freaking annoying like i can't they, like the people who actually have a sense of color within them it's the most frustrating thing and that's why i like i said the first six pages of this introduction are talking about this there is a lived experience right in front of us i mean most but most of our concepts of nature that even we have learned that those of us who understand nature and love nature live through referentials referentials like this right here this is a referential of nature something that is you know this is we're seeing nature through this glass and you know this is kind of a cool concept but and one of the, my favorite examples of this is all the protesters you know look at these climate crisis people right here are do they have good intentions yes or that what they're doing is wrong Probably not. This is it's good emotional rage from the heart, and they're frustrated and want to help. But like I said, the the this isn't waking up people to living a phenomenological experience. That that has this has nothing to do with that. Politics. Um, th 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 these people. This protest right here isn't saying, look around. Should I worry? We are orphans. Less meat equals less heat. Um, this isn't, they are calling for political solutions from their overlords who are also living in referential worlds. Do you think that the, um, for instance, you know, one of the biggest politicians in America right now um, is a young female from New York City. How much, one of the big environmental activists, I should say, how much nature is she really living in Washington, D.C. and the Bronx? Let's just be honest. It doesn't matter how great her intentions are, even though I think they're good, and I think it's a good, you know, great direction, but how, 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 how sincere of a nature lover are you into waking this up, or is this about economics and about different types of control? And that's what it seems like all this is about. These people don't seem very general like genuine phenomenological um, observers of nature. They seem, you know, caught up in an aesthetic. The axiomatic disconnection from phenomenology creates bad decisions. Without a worldwide acknowledgement of that, groups will find ways around laws created to help the environment. No matter what laws get passed or what happens, we it basically come, has to come down to an environmental anarchy that we create a new baseline for society, that we create a new baseline for people where it's like, wow, should we be living in these weird suburban, like in Las Vegas, where I live, uh, a lot of people have pools and waste a lot of water and like have all these plants that like aren't producing any bountiful you know food for them we could it isn't inconceivable to raise the baseline where everyone would be like yeah that's that's a good idea we don't need that like we could have community pools and like whatnot and this, this these referentials and these things and this disconnection starts to create problems and rifts and cracks in the society because these people right here, like I said, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. 
These people right here are creating a polarity. These people are now creating a separation between the religious people, between the scientists, the people who we need. These people are like, they're just crazy liberals. Um, that's not what we need because you can live, you know, with the Kremlin, the weird thing is, is that a lot of, a lot of the world's religions can actually exist coexist with the phenomenological experience with nature you know with actual re real reality no but like people like Wendell Berry you know the a beautiful author he was a Christian he just I think he's still alive but he donated his whole farm to a uh, small Christian university and you know kind of and he wrote about you know integrating those two things that's fine and that's like kind of a new way new wave of thinking for people who want to continue their family traditions or whatever but those people are going to be driven away by this, by these types of actions and by nailing yourself to the tree. And like I said, there is a time and a place for that. But the way that it's being done seems a little bit like making nature the referential because that's all this is. Look, climate justice, nature, the climate is now the referential for justice and justice is going to be through laws that are going to be enforced by, you know, officers or whoever. And it's all kind of, it's all kind of wacky, everybody. This is all kind of a far away cry from living a phenomenological experience with nature. And I won't probably get too much into this and becoming animal again, but I just wanted to touch on that. And you know what I mean? Boom. Um, and these are just, you know, some nice photos real fast. I don't know what I had these in for. Beautiful. So I live in the desert, everybody. I live in Las Vegas. And... I have heard thousands, like literally thousands from thousands of different people about why the Vegas, why Vegas sucks. Oh my God. Like right now I'm looking out my window. It's literally 111 degrees right now. That is not fun. If you've, I don't know, you have probably never been in 111 degree heat. It is just the, the, the journey from 95 to 111 is insurmountable. It's like the journey from like zero to negative 15 or, or you know, it's feels a lot hotter, but People don't want to acknowledge or live in this desert. Everybody abuses it. Everybody hates it. And the abuse of the natural world continues every single day. And this has to start in our local communities. Um, for instance, there is, okay, and well, excuse me, the way I wanted to tie this in is that the government, the United States government has deemed that this desert, my desert, not my desert, but our desert, uh, <laughs> has is the was the place to do the nuclear testing for you know, out at Creech Air Force Base that's where they did all the underground and above ground nuclear testing because they saw it as nothing they saw this you know right here as not having any substance to it just being some you know sagebrush and some cactuses and they still do military they don't you know explode nukes but they still do military testing the largest you know drone tests happen out in that desert and it Unlike other places I've been, when I go out to the desert, at any point there's glass everywhere and, you know, ATVers and people abuse the shit out of the desert because they don't understand the desert. And anyone can understand the desert if you are experiencing a phenomenological experience of nature. It's really easy to enjoy Hawaii or like California or Yosemite or Yellowstone. If you've ever been there, suddenly all the all the really mean and weird people who like have day jobs and like are really nice and they're enjoying nature and they're sitting out and they don't do that though in their hometown. They don't go out and ex have that same reaction. But the desert is even worse. Everyone just hates it. And it's, you know, just really crazy about how once, like I said, once again, it, we have to go all the way. This is not a drill. We have to go all the way with living this phenomenological experience because if we don't, certain things are going to get left out. It's like, oh, well, you know, the desert's not that bad or like slaughterhouses. We can have a little bit to feed everybody. Like, you know, the little things are getting like, oh, we can burn that, build that subdevelopment over there. Like, you know, that's, that might be sacred ground, but whatever, man. Like we have the rights. We've owned the rights for a while. And you guys know what I mean. That... And the reason we do this is that we, let's, let's pull this, let's read a couple quotes real fast. Well, first of all, we don't want to be stuck here, everybody. That is the root of it all. We do not want to be stuck here in nature. Like, 
not in nature, but in our reality. Guess what? I am going to die one day and it could be painful. And your my parents and my friends and my cat and my recently deceased dog all are going to die. I may have to live these painful deaths and go through painful deaths. And um, I live in a world where there are, today there was a, you know, an attack in Afghanistan. There are, and billions of animals get killed every, every year. I live in a cruel world, but I have to, to live a pure phenomenological existence. I have to accept that world, everybody. And the ultimate nature of death, you know, and this is like kind of getting into Ernest Becker's denial of death text. It drives out the theoretical solutions. Instead of thinking and feeling and becoming more animal, we create, um, you know, mass supermarkets and graveyards and mass freeways. We create all these things instead of acknowledging what's going on. And I would like to read off, um, we're almost finished everybody, a couple more quotes that I found that were great. Whether sounded on the tongue, printed on the page, or shimmering on screen, language's primary gift is not to re rep represent the world around us, but to call ourselves into the vital presence of that world and into deep and attentive presence with one another. These pages, too, are nothing other than talking leaves. Their insights sur stirred by the winds, their vitality reliant on periodic sunlight and on cool, dark water si seeping up from within the ground. Step into their shade. Listen close. Something other than the human mind is at play here. We have to create this, this book right here, Becoming Animal, what you have listened to for 11 pages for 27 minutes about at this point is a psychological text, one that will teach us to have better interrelations with one another. If we can observe the natural world, our axiomatic experience of the world, how we are supposed to participate in advanced, how are we supposed to participate in a, it, everyone, how are we supposed to participate in advanced level human problems if we haven't learned to experience the easiest thing out there, the, our axiomatic experience of nature? If we haven't learned to solve that, which we haven't, that's what the drive of into civilization and into war and all those other things was about. If we haven't solved that problem yet, then what, what, where are we? How are we going to be able to navigate interspace travel and, you know, uh, the growing population? How are we supposed to do these things? This is the human solution, everybody creating a phenomenological experience with nature. This is the root of where we have to start no matter what. I don't care about laws. I don't care about anything. I don't care about the news. I care about making sure people know that this is happening and getting them out there without their phones, without the photo and spending time out there. You know, one of my, one thing that really pisses me off sometimes is when I'm out trying to have a nice time in nature and there's people around, you know, you want to be alone sometimes, but I live out, I live in a city of 3 million people and I drive 20 minutes outside of town and hang out the, can hang out in the desert even 10 minutes outside of town and not see anybody for a whole day. There's 3 million, there's only two ways out of my, really out of my city, two places to really go outskirts, you know, North and South. So 1.5 million people, if not 3 million people have access to this one point and no one's stopping. There is nobody. Nobody else had the thought to come out and take a look around, you know? And like I said, this is only to, this is the, the minimum distance away that you need to get to, you know, feel like you're in nature. No one else had that thought. And I'm sure you feel like this at your hometown. Go outside to the outskirts. How many people are you seeing? And in nice places like Portland and others, but there is, you know, the, the trails are busier. But ser serial killers torture animals because they were abandoned by the family to go hang out in the backyard by themselves. In this weird reality, they, we, have, we need to teach people how to live a phenomenological experience, an aware experience with contact in nature. Or the problems are going to magnify and get bigger. The unrest, the in logical insanity, the divide between, you know, the, the political polarity is going to continue to increase no matter what. Our inner reality, everybody, and, you know, tech addiction, pill addiction, you know, it's all going to, it's all going to continue to manifest. Our inner reality as a collective manifests as objective reality. Te and 
that's it, everybody. I mean, you've heard that before, our inner reality, but it's our inner reality, not my inner reality, our inner reality. And it's up to you. That's what this course is about. I'm giving this away for free and going to be supporting people for free on their journey, no matter how dumb, how stupid, how smart, no matter who, how trolling, who come as you are, let's get going, everybody. So I have an assignment, everybody. And like I said, watch the intro video or go to uh, the info page on the course page to figure out um, where to submit your assignment. It's pretty self-explanatory though. But so I want about this presentation or about these first 12 pages, 100 to 200 words of journaling about the chapter. I won't be reading these. Oh, hold on. Let me, sorry. Excuse me. But use this as a time to gather and clarify your thoughts. And the reason I won't be reading these is because this is a personal time for you to be writing. I'm going to be reading uh, your book reports two times in a row to, you know, get, and your essay, final essays to get a full picture. But this is not that. This is an informal place for you guys to write. And so don't worry about grammar or like whatever. This is literally just to make sure you are writing because writing is important. Explicating your thoughts is important. Um, the intuitive ideas that come to you now will be invaluable to you while writing your book report and final paper. So here are some tips. This may be an excellent time to reflect on the evolution of your relationship with nature. So like just this, this, this intro for this book, I'll just talk about how you've maybe come into a more phenomenological experience with nature, maybe coming from a, maybe you, we all kind of had it as kids and then probably lost it. And how have you returned or why do you want to return? That's maybe a good time to write about that. And then if you're stuck, if you have no idea what to do, and, and if you want to complete the course, you're going to have to do this. Um, just pick a passage, like one, even use one of the quotes I picked, and if you want, and from the text that spoke to you and respond to that. Just write 100 to 200 words about that. That should be a paragraph or two. And I think that's all, everybody. Thank you guys for tuning in. This was a monster presentation, and expect more soon. Comment. You write, post your journal entry in the comments if you want. That would be great. I mean, post it on the website, too to get credit, but um, say what's up, tell me how you guys liked it, and I will see you guys later. Peace.